Well, September the 10th marks the 30-year anniversary of the single Smells Like Teen Spirit by the band Nirvana. Michael Azarad is an author, music journalist, editor, and musician. He's a graduate from Columbia University, and he's written for publications such as Spin, Rolling Stone, and the New York Times, and I guess most importantly in this conversation, his 1993 biography, Come As You Are, the story of Nirvana has been named one of the 50 greatest rock books ever written. Michael, thanks so much for joining me today. Hi, Jacques. Thanks for having me. Well, Michael, when you hear Teen Spirit 30 years ago, what comes to mind? What do you think? Who is this? This is great. And uh, I walked in my friend Carol's office and asked, and she said, it's Nirvana. And I thought, that, that grunge band who did that record on Sub Pop, that's them? It's like they had, you know, turned into Cinderella, not the band, but the, the fairy tale. <laughs> um, just something had happened, or maybe Robert Johnson at the Crossroads. They'd gone from, you know, pretty good band to something that, it, even at the time, it sounded kind of era-defining. And then not long after that, you heard Smells Like Teen Spirit, you know, blasting out of every car and deli and just on the street somewhere. Everyone was talking about it and playing it. And it's just one of those times in popular music history when that happens, when everybody is kind of listening to the same song all at once. It was kind of a beautiful moment. Yeah, Michael, um, growing up in the 80s, um, the 80 hard rock crossing over the top 40 thing was really big with the Bon Jovis and Def Leppards and Guns N' Roses. And it became a bit oversaturated, right? It became uh, the Wingers and Warrant, Cherry Pie, and these songs, and Vince Neil challenging Axl Rose to a fight on MTV, kind of cartoonish. Uh, the backlash was coming, and this was the vehicle. This was kind of, they say, the asteroid that hit Earth and killed all the dinosaurs. This song really uh, launched a new era of music. Well, you know, pop, Pop's uh, pendulum, you know, swings pretty reliably. Uh, there are periods of very contrived, um, uh, kind of artificial kind of music, which is cool in its own way. But after a while, people start craving something that is, you know, for want of a better word, real, you know, authentic. And so MTV and, you know, pop radio had been flogging this hair farmer's music, you know, those pop metal bands. Uh, stuff like Milli Vanilli and boy bands and stuff like that. I think people just got tired of it. But also there was this thing happening in the background, which is Generation X, uh, which was this new thing at the time. Oh, a new generation that's taking over from the baby boomers. And Generation X had some, you know, pretty interesting and tough circumstances. A high, very high divorce rate, lots of fear of nuclear war, um, diminished expectations for their careers. A lot, of, you know, a lot of them still lived at home, even though they had graduated from college. It, it was kind of demoralizing. And that all those, those warrants and all the cherry pie songs and all that stuff didn't speak to how they were feeling. But Nirvana spoke to how these kids were feeling. And Kurt Cobain was such a different looking rock star than the John Bon Jovi, David Lee Roth, Axl Rose, these guys that were kind of, they were untouchable. They were, I'm up here and you're down there. This guy was uh, more of just somebody that could be sitting next to you in your high school class, huh? Yes, I think that's exactly right. Um, when I, uh, the first time I interviewed Kurt was for a Rolling Stone cover story uh, where he's wearing that t-shirt on the front that says corporate magazines still suck. <laughs> and uh, and I was nervous because not much was known about him. I, you know, we all knew he screamed and smashed his guitars, uh, maybe was a heroin addict, but I, I just didn't know what to expect. He seemed maybe a little intimidating, but uh, I, I was in Los Angeles for the interview, took a taxi to his house. Courtney he greets me at the door with a plate of grapes, you know, very gracious, <laughs> and uh, leads me down the hallway to Kurt. And Kurt's lying in bed. Uh, uh, apparently recuperating from a, a tour of Australia and New Zealand, Japan and stuff like that. And, um, and I was nervous and I walk in the door and he says, hi. And in that moment I thought, Oh, I know this guy. He's like, like everyone I knew in high school, you know, maybe a, 
more on the stoner end of things, you know, but he was like everyone I knew. Like he was a bright guy, he was a stoner, his parents were divorced when he was 10. He grew up on all the same music, like all this stuff just I immediately realized as soon as he said hi. And after that, it was this really comfortable interview. And I guarantee you that I'm not special in that regard. Um, I guarantee you that most of Kurt's audience would have related to him and would have found him really easy to hang out with. And he translated that into music, which was his gift. Michael, I read that you spent a lot of nights at Kurt's home, staying up late, just chatting, talking about different things. Uh, I started, well, the Rolling Stone interview was in February 92. So that's Gosh. when uh, Nevermind was really blowing up. And then I did the interviews for Come As You Are, the story of Nirvana. Um, uh, I guess while they were taking a break, you know, after touring and before recording in utero. So it was actually a pretty quiet time. And that's why Kurt had so much time to, to spend with me to do interviews. And so, yeah, I'd come over to his house, you know, late at night, 11 o'clock, midnight, because that was those were his hours. And we talked, you know, sometimes till the sun came up. And it was really great, very intimate and quiet. So, Michael, never mind. It has sold uh, 10 million copies. It seems like this is the dream of the band. Play the clubs, get the record deal. Uh, become the biggest stars in the world, but it seemed like he always struggled with being what you would think he would dream of being. How did he handle all the success and, and whatnot? Um, uh, not well. Uh, I think he got a little better at it as time went on. Uh, but, you know, uh, he had this big conflict. He grew up on bands like Cheap Trick, uh, The Cars, uh, Queen, uh, uh, you know, Aerosmith, these are bands, and he loved the Beatles. These are all bands that were incredibly famous. And uh, as far as we know, reveled in their fame. They were quite comfortable with it. They loved it. So that was his original grounding in rock music. But then he went to Olympia, Washington, where there's a very thriving, really interesting um, underground indie scene. And they uh, were, they had, there was a label there called Kill Rockstars. <laughs> that, and they were very anti rockstar. They wanted the musicians and the audience to be on completely equal footing, which is really exciting uh, and great. Uh, and it really revolutionized Kurt's thinking about making music and being an artist. But he still had that residual, you know, queen. Uh, damage. <laughs> so that, that was a really big conflict in him. And uh, he, he was very close to the people in Olympia who championed this anti-star ethic. And here he was becoming a star and he didn't know what to do about it. Um, I think also he didn't have the greatest uh, self-image. So he was thinking, well, why am I famous? Like, I don't deserve this. And, it was, you know, there was a lot of conflict about that. And I don't think he ever completely resolved it. Yeah, very sad ending. Um, the video is mentioned just as much as, I guess, the actual song. It was the perfect marriage between song and video. A lot of people, when that video hit, hit MTV, said, I've never seen anything like this before. This was such a departure from the girls in the video, hey, look, we're cool type deal. This was a totally a, a, a right turn from all that. Pretty much. Um, uh, I, I think... Um you know, there are those punk rock cheerleaders in the Smells Like Teen Spirit video who, yeah. who uh, I think uh, the director, I can't remember, someone specifically asked that they be uh, beautiful in a conventional way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there is that, you know, that one, uh, you know, nod to a convention uh, in that video. But otherwise, yeah, I mean, Kurt and the rest of the band didn't look anything like, you know, Warrant and Winger and all that. Um, they kind of looked more like, uh, their audience, which is, you know, that was one of the most exciting things about it. A, a, actually, interesting thing about that video is that it was based in large part on um, a 1979 movie called Over the Edge, which I've always loved. And it turned out Kurt really was one of Kurt's favorite movies, but it was actually Matt Dillon's first film. And it's about a bunch of bored, alienated suburban stoner kids who uh, rebel and, uh, eventually blow up their school. Uh, 
So, uh, you know, kind of prescient, unfortunately. But, uh, but yeah. I think that movie really appealed to Kurt as a high schooler. Uh, I think he was just about the same age as the kids in the movie. And I think it made a huge impact on him. Uh, also, the soundtrack had the Ramones, Cheap Trick, uh, and the Cars. These are all the crucial Kurt, you know, sources. So, uh, you know, that's a really interesting kind of background on the Smells Like Teen Spirit video. But yeah, I mean, I think it appealed to the rebel in just about any teenager. Yeah. You go to YouTube, Michael, the video's got one billion views on YouTube. <laughs> one wow. billion. It's a lot of hits. <laughs> That's respectable. Yeah, and you know, I'm here in Baton Rouge and LSU, Louisiana State University, right down the street here. You see kids on campus wearing Nirvana t-shirts with the smiley face and the closed eyes and everything. You wonder if they've actually listened to the music or if they've just bought a t-shirt to, to be cool, what's old is new again type deal. But um, mm -hmm. there is that presence still uh, 30 years later after the song uh, was released. And just going to sporting events and when they crank that thing out of speakers at a big stadium, uh, it is as powerful today as it was back then. It's just an amazing song. Yeah, it is an amazing song. Um... I wonder if part, part of the reason that it sounds good out of those big speakers is because of um, the producer, Butch Vig, and the guy who mixed it, um, Andy Wallace, um, both of them, uh, you know, kind of at the top of their game at that point. Uh, but yeah. yeah, it's a very powerful song. Uh, you know, it's funny, though, I, it uses these primordial rock and roll chord changes, one, four, five. Um, you know, that goes back to Louie Louie and, you know, earlier in rock and roll than that. Um, and then, you know, up through a big hit, like more than a feeling. It's just been used in so many songs. And there it is again, just, you know, and they found a new way to deliver this very time honored chord change um, in an incredibly powerful way. Um, and I think that maybe, you know, maybe there's just something, you know, timeless, you know, about that in itself, but he certainly was articulating uh, things that were in the air. Appreciate it. I know I bounce around here, so uh, uh, for, forgive my ADD here as I, <laughs> I oh, chat. Yeah, no, no problem. You know, actually, I should add, you know, those t-shirts, yeah, that's a fashion now. Uh, I live in New York. You know, you see it all the time. People wear band t-shirts and <laughs> as a, you know, old rock guy, <laughs> I want to walk up to them and say, name three songs by the Ramones, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and you know, you you think maybe they couldn't, but maybe they could. But it is a fashion to wear old rock band T-shirts. But, a, a, you know, a, a billion views doesn't, you know, lie. And um, I think Nirvana's music really speaks to uh, the current moment uh, as well as 1991. It's a, it's a guy screaming in a really catchy and <laughs> compelling way about being angry and uncertain. And there's still a lot to be angry and uncertain about today. And maybe that's part of the appeal. Also, you know, those songs are really catchy. Like they're, they're, just, they're just very tuneful. Um, you know, I, I remember playing it for an older friend of mine at the time and she said, kind of like the Beatles, which I thought was really perceptive. And, you know, Kurt did pay uh, homage to the Beatles. And, you know, uh, he was clearly a fan, but there's, there's something to be said about the fact that it's just really tuneful. It's just, those are well-written songs. Yeah, Dave Grohl, I think I read him say something like, we were writing children's songs with a very heavy, uh, obviously drums and guitars and screaming, but the lyrics and the... Yeah, or, or it's, uh, yeah, uh, I think maybe he said nursery rhyme. I can't remember. But <laughs> yeah, there's, there's something very sturdy and basic about those songs. Kurt was also a huge fan of Creedence Clearwater Revival who wrote really sturdy, simple songs that are easy to sing to. And uh, I think that was really a major influence on Nirvana. And those are really simple songs too. And they're also, as far as I'm concerned, timeless. Interesting footnotes. Yeah, I read that. I never thought about Boston more than a feeling when I heard that song, but apparently Kurt Cobain thought about that a lot when he wrote it, um, that, that he's, oh, it sounds too similar. 
Uh, and it's always interesting when a band records an album, what, what's going to be the single and do you know if something's going to be successful or not? Apparently Grohl wanted In Bloom to be the lead single and then the record company thought Come As You Are would be the pop uh, hit debut and this song uh, took off like a rocket. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, you know, well, that's just um, good fortune, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I'm glad that's, uh, you know, that's some... Um, Someone went out and got "Smells Like Teen Spirit" as the first single because that it really is. Uh, it, it's a you know era defining tune. Michael, the lyrics as kids or sophomore in high school, we're jamming to this stuff, and it'd be like, "What did he just say? What? Uh, like like lithium? I'm so ugly. That's okay, cause so are you. Uh, breed. We could plant a house. We could build a tree, and then uh, Nirvana and the uh, in bloom." Uh, we can have some more nature is a whore. I mean, these were the kind of lyrics that we just hadn't um, heard before. Yeah. yeah well, he, uh, yeah. I mean, Kurt, um, he was, it's interesting. He was influenced a little bit by uh, Brian Geisen, uh, the artist of uh, the mid 20th century, who was also worked with William Burroughs. And he kind of pioneered this concept of the cut up where you just take lines of, from newspapers or your own poetry and you reassemble them in a way that kind of makes your ears prick up. And Kurt did that a lot. He just kept notebooks of lyrics and he just recombined them in ways until they resonated with him. And they may not make sense in a literal way, but somehow you just feel it in your gut. Um, I mean, a classic example is he's just on Smells Like Teen Spirit. He just sings over and over, a denial, a denial. What's he talking about? You don't yeah. know here, but you know here. And that happened just over and over with his lyrics. They just connected on this, you know, sensual way rather than an intellectual way. Um, and... Uh, he he also got that, uh, we should really mention the Pixies and uh, Black Francis, the singer and songwriter of the Pixies. He was very influenced uh, in that approach by him too. And again, Black Francis, you know, he's a very powerful lyricist, but um, it's, a lot of it doesn't make linear sense. Like one of the most misunderstood lyrics in Smells Like Teen Spirit is a mulatto, an albino, a mosquito, my libido. <laughs> I got that right away. He's talking about two, he's, these are pairs of opposites, the mulatto and albino, so pretty much opposite. And then a mosquito, which is a you know, famously small animal, and my libido, what's the opposite of really small? Uh, so he's just saying he was extremely horny. <laughs> that, that's what that, that couple is about. And there's a lot of stuff that, um, I don't know, makes sense if you just let it flow over you <laughs> and not analyze it too hard. Yeah. And th but that was the idea. It was like, how do these words go with the music? He's not a storyteller. He's a songwriter. And that's the idea. You, it's, a, it's an impressionistic thing. And if you let it happen, it's incredibly powerful. Very well said. Um, you spent a lot of time with the band. Obviously, you couldn't know at the time that the drummer, Dave Grohl, was going to become one of the biggest, if not the biggest, rock stars currently. What was he like to be around back then? It's funny, Dave, um, you know, he's a really savvy man. And he sensed all the craziness going on around the band, and he consciously defended himself against it. He just wouldn't get lured into the drama. He just rose above, you know, and he, he maintained his sanity and his, you know, mental and physical health, I think, um, by just not getting into it. And that was incredibly smart of him. And uh, so uh, he was, you know, and Kurt, um, you know, when Kurt talked about Dave, he would say, he's the most well-adjusted boy I know. And I think part of it was, that was frankly being sarcastic because, you know, if you're well-adjusted, you know, you're not cool. But I think he also, I think, it was also um, he was he was envious of Dave for being so steady and you know on top of things, diligent and hardworking and all those you know and well adjusted. So uh, so yeah, that was Dave. Um, you know, loved to party with the best of them, but kept his head together. 
And that was exceedingly difficult in the face of everything that was going on. So yeah, hats off to him. And Chris Novoselic, he, he, he goes a, a whole nother path, right? Became a politician, is that right? Uh, he ran for office. I, I don't think he won the office. Uh, well, maybe he got he had some local political office and he was yeah. the head of his local Grange for many years. And uh, I think he's more, uh, really more of an activist. Okay. Uh, uh, and and um, I mean, really did, has led an exemplary life. You know, he, he cares about his community. He's well-loved in his little town. Um, he does all kinds of, yeah, like his political activism and he's a good, you know, he's a good American. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And he still plays music. He knows he's a music lifer, but you know, he may not be in another big band again, but he plays locally and really enjoys it. Um, yeah. I, yeah. Chris has got a great life. That's awesome. And, and Nirvana, even though their music came across as being dark, it seemed like they had a sense of humor too, like the In Bloom video they did where that's Doug Llewellyn from the People's Court, right? At the beginning, introducing yeah. the band. <laughs> uh, Nirvana, uh, welcome Nirvana. And, and the, the 50s or 60s crowd in black and white cheering them on. They, 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 were, they had a sense of humor too. Yeah, and that I think is, you know, that's pretty crucial to, I think, you know, any artist in any genre, in any medium. Um, you have to have a you know, little bit of a sense of humor. Uh, but I think it really gave them, in particular Nirvana, uh, you know, s some extra facets. And, I, you know, Kurt was perceived to be, you know, something of a storm cloud and he could be really preachy about his audience. And he was he was aware of that. And he didn't even like that about himself, but sometimes he couldn't help it. So all the all that dark stuff was kind of offset by the sense of humor. And that really made gave their music and their whole artistic, you know, thing a, a depth that it simply wouldn't have had. Appreciate it. A few more things, Michael. Um, it's funny a lot of times when a, a band can sometimes have a, uh, an interesting relationship with their biggest song. Um, you know, sometimes the band will shy away from it because they think it's getting too much attention or whatever. I did read that at one point, maybe Kurt and the band thought Teen Spirit was kind of maybe rising too above the rest of their material. Um, it's interesting, they played New Orleans back on December the 3rd of 1993, and it was, the, it was the sixth song in the set. It wasn't like the big encore or grand finale or whatever. Do, do you remember how they, they viewed the song moving forward? Uh, I was actually at that show, and I, I don't know, I saw them play, I don't know, at least a dozen times, and I, I never saw Kurt play Smells Like Teen Spirit completely co correctly. He always messed up something. And that was on purpose. You know, he, I think um, maybe he felt like, you know, he was a performing monkey playing that song, even though maybe he was tired of it or, yeah, just didn't want to play it or thought, it, yeah, it overshadowed some of their other songs. I know he thought some of their other songs were better. Mm -hmm. um, so he, uh, you know, he would intentionally, you know, <laughs> sabotage it as a little bit of a, a protest. So, yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's it. I, I've always wondered that about musicians, people who have a hit and have a long career and yet are somehow obligated to play this song for, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20, 50 years, maybe. Yeah. What must that be like? You're sing a song comes out of a particular moment that you're feeling and you have to get back into that feeling 10 years later when you're a completely or a very different person. I don't know. It must be really hard. Yeah. Yeah. It's a tricky, it's a tricky dance. Like Billy Corgan of the Smashing Pumpkins. Uh, he, I, I heard he'd play three hours and then maybe not play a song you've ever heard. It was kind of this deal of, you know, I'm not going to play the hits or whatever, but then that's how you made all that money. And that's why these people are here. So uh, it's interesting. Yeah. That, I mean, maybe uh, that's why some people are there for sure. Maybe, I don't know, maybe most, but yeah, I don't know, speaking for myself, I, I just want to hear what I'm really, if I see a band, I'm really into what they're into. Mm -hmm. And I want to, them to play the songs that they're into playing that night. Yeah, That's what makes it special. And, uh, you know, if it's not, then they're just sort of 
they're just sort of performing. Um, and there's not much more to it than that. But if they're just totally into every song they play and they're not doing it out of obligation, that's to me, that's probably going to be a much more exciting show. Yeah, right. Well said. So in 19, uh, January of 1992, Nevermind knocked Michael Jackson out of the top spot on the Billboard 200. Um, watched a few documentaries on the making of Nevermind and uh, the people from the Seattle area just saying that was unthinkable. That was just, um, that something like that would never happen, that one of these little bands from Seattle would, knight, would knock Michael Jackson at the top spot. Uh, was that a significant um, occurrence? And, and did was, was Kurt Cobain excited by that, or he just say, oh, well, that's not any big deal? <laughs> I, I, think, uh, I think that was a very significant occurrence uh, because it kind of showed this changing of the generational guard not just in pop music, but in, you know, in our culture. The, the, the baby boomer thing was dying away and there was a new bunch of kids coming up and they wanted their own music. They didn't want this manufactured stuff that was kind of forced down their throats simply by being played over and over and again on the radio. They wanted something that was by, for, and about them. And, uh, Michael Jackson had made a, yeah, he released a, a really good record, but it wasn't as good as the previous one. Uh, so there was that, uh, but still there was something really profoundly earth shaking about the fact that Nirvana replaced Michael Jackson uh, on that chart. It was really symbolic. There was, um, yeah, Generation X was coming to the fore, uh, not just as a musical force, but as a political, cultural, demographic, and, you know, frankly, a consumer force. Uh, that was a really, really big deal. But, um, you know, most people at the record label didn't expect Nirvana to sell more than, I don't know, 250,000 copies, which sounds like a lot now. But back then it was, you know, a modest success. And, and I think, uh, and Kurt wasn't really expecting to blow up like that. And for a guy who was like a high school dropout with a poor self-image from a kind of rough and tumble uh, rural logging town, um, you know, who's basically homeless for the past, you know, previous two or three years, to suddenly be the biggest rock star on the planet and have everyone beating a path to his door and asking him all kinds of questions uh, was pretty overwhelming. And... I'm sure a lot of people would think like, wow, that must have been great. You know, suddenly he's rich and he's a rock star and all this stuff. But it's it's really heavy and it's really intense. And if you're not uh, built to take it, it can be really devastating, believe it or not. <laughs> it's not just being a rock star. is not a 100 percent picnic. It's, there's a lot of pressure and stress. Yeah, Michael, there's an old saying, right? You've got your whole life to write your first album, and then you've got six months to write your next one. And uh, <laughs> how, how did they, uh, I mean, obviously, In Utero was a great follow-up, and uh, Heart Shaped Box, some people I've read on the YouTube comments, I like that song better than Teen Spirit. But how did they deal with the, uh, the quote-unquote pressure of following up that album, and was it a problem? I don't think so. There's bunch of great songs on that on in utero as well they um you know truth be told though a bunch of the songs on in utero uh were written you know around the time that the nevermind songs were written so uh you know kurt had a little backlog of of songs you know all ready to go so even though they'd done all that touring and stuff they 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 had some songs in their back pocket and then a couple of those songs were kind of jammed into existence on In Utero. Um, they're, you know, wh whipped up pretty quickly. Uh, so, uh, but, you know, they came up with some great songs. Yeah, Heart Shape Box is a, a beautiful song. Um, Penny Royalties, you know, that's a pretty well-crafted song. Um, and there's a bunch more. And uh, I guess, the, you know, the question is, you know, what would the next album have been like? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, but I think Kurt had learned that he needed some downtime to, to, to rest and recuperate from touring and, you know, being the face of the band 
and uh, and just have some time to himself to to write songs. So uh, I'm sure he would have done that with the next record. In Utero sold five million. Uh, MTV unplugged in New York, eight million copies. I did not realize that until I looked it up. Just uh, that's a staggering number for a, for a live album. Um, Michael in 1991, uh, just uh, 1991 musically. Nirvana, Nevermind, Pearl Jam, Ten, which sold 13 million. Uh, Soundgarden, Bad Motor Finger, Red Hot Chili Peppers with Blood Sugar Sex Magic, Guns N' Roses, Use Your Illusion One and Two, Metallica, The Black Album. That's uh, that's a pretty solid uh, list of musical releases in that year. Tremendous. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it was just a, it was it's just one of those those magic times, you know, when uh, things shift and there's a lot of things in the air. Um, you know, we'd just come off 12 years of uh, Reagan and Bush, and we were transitioning into a, a de democratic presidency. Um, you know, things, a lot of things were changing in, in the air. And, you know, when, when that's happening, some cool music will come out of it. Also, you know, for the previous 10 years before Nevermind came out, there was this whole underground rock community that was uh, building up and building up, um, which I wrote about uh, in a band called Our Bank, in a book called Our Bank Could Be Our Life. And that started with bands like, you know, Black Flag and um, Dead Kennedys and hardcore bands like Minor Threat and Mission to Burma, uh, The Replacements, Who's Could Do and so on. These bands built up this network and all across the country of fans and record stores and radio stations, fanzines, venues. And there was this network and it was all kind of spring loaded to, uh, to really pop. And someone was gonna come out of that scene and, and uh, take over you know, rock culture because the infrastructure was there. And uh, REM was a really big one. They were maybe the first, a Jane's Addiction kind of came out of that. They also had a really big record with nothing shocking. Um, Faith No More came out of that community. They had a big record, but Nirvana was the one that was the, you know, the shot heard around the world in terms of coming out of that indie rock community in the U.S. from like about '81 to about 1991. And so that's, I think that was a really huge part of it. There was something bubbling under that just had to eventually pop. Uh, Michael, there's that old saying, it's better to burn out than fade, fade away. And some people believe whether you're Janis Joplin or Jimi Hendrix or Jim Morrison or Kurt Cobain, your status gets elevated when you die at a young age. Um, there are always, I mean, no matter what, whether you're the Beatles or whoever, somebody's going to say, well, those guys are overrated. Certainly, you've heard that perhaps over the, oh, Nirvana, they're overrated, you know, just because they didn't, you know, we couldn't say, oh, their last three albums sucked, <laughs> right? So how do, you, um, how do you feel about their legacy? Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, being underrated or overrated, I don't know. I, I think they were a great, great band. I mean, really fascinating, soul-stirring, life-affirming, life actually, yeah. music. Uh, I think, you know, Kurt made that music to as a balm, B-A-L-M, uh, for his own personal and physical pain. He, when he played music, he felt great. And when people heard that music, they felt it too. And it, I, I don't, that's, that feeling still hits me really hard. Um, I couldn't speak you know, about the feelings of you know, a, a 13 year old kid hearing it for the first time. I don't know, but right. it, it certainly touches me. That is one of the, the sad things about, you know, when a great artist passes uh, fairly young is that, you know, we kind of, uh, especially people who are the same age or a little younger, uh, look to them to help us interpret our, our own lives. Um, I know people look to John Lennon for that. And he was gone much too soon. And I was, you know, I was really looking forward to him you know, kind of showing me the way, uh, you know, he was, you know, much older than I am. So like everything he sang about, it, I thought like, wow, okay, so this is what's coming around the bend. 
And I was looking forward to hearing John Lennon at 50 or 60, like to hear what's coming around the band at that age. But, you know, we, we, we got deprived of that. Um, and there's a, a lot of artists like that where I, I really wish we could have learned from their perceptions about their own lives. And Kurt is surely one of them. I really would have loved to have heard what his take on being, you know, 40 and 50 and 60. It would have been interesting to see Kurt Cobain on Twitter, right? What, what would he have had to say that day? <laughs> you know, uh, uh, I, I, I suspect he would not have done Twitter. Uh, he, he, may have that, he may have just thought that's uh, too much information. <laughs> he may yeah. have stayed out of that. I don't know. Yeah, good deal. All right. Well, look, um, just in wrapping, is there anything else you'd like to share? I mean, you spent, you spent time with, with a band who made an undeniable mark in music history. And um, 30 years later, uh, people still discovering them on YouTube or Spotify or whatever they listen to these days. Um, uh, Nirvana's presence 30 years uh, after the fact. Yeah. Um, you know, I, uh, uh, during the, the depths of the pandemic, I, uh, I started something that I've been meaning to do for a long time, which is to annotate Come As You Are, go through it and add insights I've gained uh, in the inter intervening years and um, uh, make corrections or add cultural context, explain things that maybe today's reader might not get from the 90s. Um, I just noticed you know, all kinds of patterns in the book and, and the, what Kurt said. And I was just really struck by how much he embodied, not just his time, but his, his age group at, at any time. You know, someone in their 20s is making some really big realizations and coming out of adolescence and entering full on adulthood. And it's a very uh, fertile time. Uh, you have some really interesting thoughts. Some of them are right, some of them are wrong, but they're always provocative. And I think coming back to Kurt as a person uh, is really, really important and not to make him into, uh, you know, this kind of demigod, this rock celebrity, because that's not what he felt like and it's not what he wanted to be. But if you approach him as a person, um, what he had to say and, and the music he made is incredibly uh, touching and impactful. And I hope that people still can appreciate that today. Yeah, and you know you're right. That song, they dropped that in 2002. That came out. Uh, I think that was the last song the band ever recorded, and it was just another, it was another gem uh, that, uh, that they, they gave us. He also, uh, I think the la one of the last songs he recorded was, I think he was just sitting on his bed in, a, in his bedroom with an acoustic guitar, but he sang a song called Do Re Mi, which I think is possibly his greatest song. And uh, I think you could probably find that uh, on the various streaming services. And uh, yeah, there was a lot more where that came from. And it's just really sad that we'll never get to hear it. This is just off the cuff. Uh, just in the last several years, Michael, like uh, a guy of my generation. So uh, last 10 years, what? Tom Petty, Prince, Glenn Fry, Eddie Van Halen. Uh, there's been a lot of huge stars that, that have passed away. I know people pass away every year, but it just seems like we've had a flood of, um, you know, very influential people that have died in recent years. Well, you know, uh, uh, and it's been, you know, it's devastating, but you know what? Um, that's life. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, like a younger generation of people who may not um, be that familiar with death are now getting to that age where their heroes, people who are 15, 20 years older, maybe, are getting to that age where they might mm -hmm. die. And every, every generation experiences that anew, you know? Um, you know, baby boomers started sadly very early when Big Bopper and Richie Valens and um, Buddy Holly uh, went down that plane. And, you know, those were teenagers who were not familiar with death. And it was, it was devastating because they just had no experience with it. And that's happened with every generation. And, you know, now this generation is, is facing up to that. And it's just, you know, it's, it's going to keep happening. And I think because I think there were 
probably more rock stars, you know, starting in maybe the late 60s and moving ahead in time. There were comparatively few, I think, prior to that. But, uh, you know, the more rock stars you have, the more rock stars are going to die. And so I would say, you know, buckle your seatbelts is, is, is going to keep happening and it's going to be tough. So, you know, appreciate these people while they're still alive and maybe even let them know if you can by buying their records or going to their shows someday or sharing their music with your friends. Michael, thanks so much for joining me, man. This was, uh, I was intellectually, you know, really outmatched here. A guy that went to Columbia and all this. This is like, if this was a football game, I'd be a 50 point underdog. It's a conversation, not a competition, but you know what I'm saying. Oh, you get asked great questions, Jacques. It was really, it was a great pleasure.